Well, ha happy Memorial Day weekend, get well. Uh, this is one of those Sundays where uh, the worship center usually is not as full as it normally is because uh, people are traveling or they're taking a, a long weekend, but here I stand. And it is completely empty. Uh, out, outside of Jeremy and Michelle that are here, uh, we're just recording this service for you. And so uh, it's kind of lonely, but uh, I want you to know that it moves us one Sunday closer, uh, one day closer to our time of gathering back together. And we so look forward to that. Uh, Memorial Day weekend is one of my favorite holidays that we do celebrate. Uh, my heart swells with pride when I think of those of you who have served in the military and those who have lost loved ones uh, for this fight for freedom. Uh, and the words thank you uh, just are not sufficient, but they're the only words that we can give. So I hope you'll receive our thank you and be blessed with that gratitude. And like the opening video that you saw earlier, uh, the best way for us to live a thankful life is to make the most of this life that we have been given. Uh, today, we complete our sermon series on the book of Ephesians, and I hope you've enjoyed this study as much as the teaching team has enjoyed in presenting it. Uh, the title of this series came from a book that was created by a Chinese pastor uh, Watchman Nee, and it's on sit, walk, and also stand. Uh, he divided the book of Ephesians up into those three positions that we as a follower of Christ need to assume. Uh, that first position was that of sitting, which means trusting. We trust, we sit in the work that Jesus has done for us. Then there's this position of walking. Walking in the work or serving, uh, the position of involvement in the kingdom uh, and how we live out our relationship with Jesus. Today, uh, we look at that third position of standing. As a follower of Christ, no matter our age, no matter our gender, as a follower of Jesus, we are called to stand, to take our place as a soldier, as a warrior in the battle, the battle that is described in Ephesians 6, verse 12, where it says, against the evil schemes of the dark world and spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. Folks, it is not by accident that this topic of standing firm against the spiritual darkness of this world falls on Memorial Day weekend. It was several weeks ago that we were putting together different sermon series that we were going to teach and share with you. And as we were working through this sermon series, we put down today's uh, scripture verses of Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 on May 24th. And we didn't have the immediate connect that that was Memorial Day weekend. So it is not by accident that this topic falls on today. Uh, and as my friend in Starful always reminds me, he says, Bill, if you're not paying attention to the work of God, you're going to miss it. So here we are today dealing with this topic about this battle against spiritual forces. So let's look at this position of standing. As you read Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, uh, you'll find that the position of standing is mentioned three times uh, throughout these verses. You'll see it on the screen. In verse 11, we're called to stand against the devil's schemes. In verse 13, we're called to stand our ground. In verse 14, we are called to stand firm as we dress in the different pieces of battle armor that are described here. So we stand against, we stand our ground, and we stand firm. There is no doubt that this position of standing carries the imagery of a Roman soldier. Uh, two little known facts concerning a Roman soldier are this. First, a Roman soldier had a shield, he had a breastplate, he had a helmet, Everything that Paul mentions, the brilliance of the military of Rome uh, was its organization. In battle, a Roman soldier was responsible to defend only about the five or six feet 
uh, around himself. He didn't worry about the five or six feet to his right or the five or six feet to his left. His only worry was where he was. And so the Roman soldier's job was to stand in place where the commander had put him. The soldier's responsibility was a, wasn't to win the battle on his own. Uh, he had to be faithful to his sovereign, to his commander, uh, where he, that sovereign, that commander had put him. And he had to dig in, and he had to uh, do that for all the good that were involved, for that whole line of soldiers that were there. He could not back down. He had to hold his ground. So the Christian has the same requirement as he or she stands. Uh, you stand at home. Uh, you stand in your neighborhood. You stand in school uh, for Jesus. You stand at work uh, for your faith. Wherever I am, uh, I have to defend that plot of ground that God has given me. And so wherever you are, uh, I can't be there. You have to be there. You have to show up. You can't slack. You can't give way. Uh, you have to stand. And wherever I am, I have to stand for you as well. The task of the Roman soldier was to be faithful where he was. The same is true for us as a follower of Christ. The second part of this image of standing as a Roman soldier had to do with their shoes. They had the state-of-the-art sandals. On the bottom of those sandals were cleat-like exposures that uh, it protruded out. Uh, they did that for the soldier so they could stand firm and they could hold their ground and could, they could not slip, they could not slide, uh, they could not be pushed back, but they could stand firm. In Ephesians 6, Paul is clear that we are called to stand and we are to do battle for our Lord against the evil of this world. And Paul, he doesn't mince words. He doesn't shy away about the adversary uh, that we face in this world. I'm not sure about your belief about evil, uh, the spiritual forces of this world. Many in today's world, they scoff at the notion that there is evil or there's an existence of Satan. And they argue that that's only a figment of one's imagination. And they flippantly, they brush it off uh, with the mindset that whoever believes that, it, it, they're just part of the less educated in a society. For me, as I study Scripture, as I live life, I have no doubt about the cosmic battle that we're involved in. This passage of Scripture in Ephesians 6 is rich and deep. In fact, there's so much that's in these verses from verse 10 through 20. Uh, it could be a sermon series unto itself. Yet what I want to do today is I want to give you four strategies that you and I need to employ as a soldier uh, for Christ as we hold our ground, as we stand firm against the evil cosmic forces of this dark world. To do that, then let's know this. First, let's identify who this battle is against. The Bible speaks very directly that the real enemy, the nemesis of our faith of this land, uh, has a name. His name is Satan. You might know him as the devil or the evil one. The word devil traces its origin back all the way to a verb that means to divide. Because the devil is a divider. He divides homes. He divides friendship. He divides people from their relationship with God. What Satan did to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he continues to do with everyone who has been born since. And what Satan seeks to do, he seeks to drive a wedge, to split a relationship, to separate people from their heavenly father. And most importantly, what Satan wants to do is to rob you of your testimony about Jesus. Satan exists to populate hell. 
And Satan exists to make life hell for the believer. Satan is real. Scripture describes him as a fallen angel from heaven. Scripture describes him as a lion that roams the land, that seeks to kill, destroy, and to uh, steal. It is important for us to identify our enemy. However, the greatest brilliance of Satan is that he has convinced us as humans, and especially those of us in the church, that he does not exist. As a believer, we have to recognize that our enemy is a deliberate enemy, an organized enemy, a sinister enemy, and an enemy that we as humans cannot see. Uh, We can only see him through divine revelation. For you and me, what we normally see is only the wake of Satan's destruction, what is left behind after he has been involved. We see the aftermath. We see the corruption. We see the philosophical and intellectual denials, the perversion, the godless ideologies, the social violence. We only see the wake of what Satan leaves behind. Scripture identifies Satan as the problem. Now, in seeing or having experienced firsthand uh, the wake of destruction that Satan leaves behind, it can cause a great fear within us. It makes us feel so ill-prepared to confront and unwilling to engage against this mighty foe. But let's understand that he is a deceiver. When I was on the dairy farm, uh, we had a feed room that was directly off uh, where we milked the cows. In that feed room, we kept the feed uh, that we would feed the cows while we milked them. In that feed room, a cat lived. That cat was in mouse heaven. You see, feed attracts mice. And so every day, uh, that cat did very well in catching mice. Then that cat had a litter of kittens. Uh, It fell upon the mama cat to teach the baby kittens uh, how to catch mice. Uh, So the mama cat uh, would catch a mouse and beat it up pretty good and cause it to be senseless almost to the point that it could not run, it could not escape. And the mama cat would bring that beaten cat, uh, the beaten mouse, uh, to the baby kittens and uh, trying to teach them how to catch a mouse. Uh, The mouse knew at that moment, that his only hope and his only defense against the baby kittens was to make himself bigger than what he really was. So you could see that mouse, and it would rear up and stretch its arm up as it stood on its back feet, scaring those ba- baby kittens, and they would run away, sending, sending the kittens into a frenzy. As a follower of Jesus, we, like those kittens, We need a healthy respect of our adversary, but we need to understand that this enemy we confront has already been defeated. Jesus came into this world for one purpose, and that was to crush the head of Satan. And we can read about that in Genesis 3. Satan was a problem of this world, and Jesus came to destroy Satan's rule. Because of what Jesus did to Satan, that means for us as followers of Jesus that we are not entering this battle fighting for victory, but we're fighting from victory. So folks, do not let Satan, the evil one, rear up and deceive you in thinking any other way. He is a defeated foe. With the enemy identified, identified, Paul moves on to uh, this call to duty, uh, this call to arms that we are to be involved in. And Paul tells us that our duty is to stand, to dig in, to show up for this battle against this evil. That's why we need to be aware and implement the four strategies that he talks about uh, for God's soldier In Ephesians 6, here's the first strategy. You can write it down. It's going to be on the screen. 
Um, but the first strategy is that you have to put on the new person, put on the new man, the new woman, if you will. When Paul talks about putting on the whole armor of God, the phrase putting on is something that he uses a lot in his writing. Uh, we find that phrase put on twice in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. And when Paul uses that phrase, it always has to do with embracing this new life that Jesus gave you. You see, when you experience salvation, you were rescued out of a life of sin that you were living in. Being rescued from a former way of life, then how do you live on the other side of rescued? Do I continue to live the way that I always have lived or do I live differently? In verse 11, on the screen, Paul writes, put on the full armor of God. Notice whose armor it is. It is God's armor. It is not our armor. And that's important to see. Now, you may be like my friend in Columbus. His name is Newton. When Newton's children were younger, uh, every morning he would get them up. He had six and he would get them up, and uh, they would dress in the full armor of God. They would put on the helmet of salvation. Uh, they would put on the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, uh, the belt of truth. And with imagination, they dress themselves every day in the armor of God, preparing themselves for the day and what was ahead. Uh, Spring Nunley, our children's ministry director, recently created a similar thing for our, our students, and it's a good teaching moment for us to be aware uh, of how we prepare for our day as we put on God's armor. The way Paul uses this verse, uh, he's letting us know that the daily spiritual wartime strategy that we need is to simply ask this question. Every day when you get up to ask, what kind of life are you committed to living this day? How are you suiting up for what lies ahead for today? How are you preparing? The truth be known, uh, we probably seldom ever ask such questions as that. So how will we live for Christ today? Are we going to be proactive in preparing for whatever the day holds for you as you represent Christ? However, on the flip side, if you're okay with dabbling in sin and don't give much thought to the fact that you are a soldier representing Christ, then I guess it's really no big deal. It's like people who say, I want Christ as my Savior, or people who say, I want to be sure that my eternity is secure, but I really didn't sign up. I didn't sign up to represent him in this five by six foot space that God has given me to defend for him. No doubt it's easy to compromise and to make excuses for life and our Christian walk. At least it is for Bill. Do you see what Paul is writing about here? Committing our day, committing our walk to him, putting on, suiting up, showing up, for the battle ahead. That is, folks, putting on the armor of God. So our first strategy is that you choose how you represent God each day, which dovetails right into the second strategy. And you can write this down as well. And that's just trust in God's character. Look at what it says in verse 16. Because Paul sets one particular and specific element of armor uh, of God apart from everything else. Look at what it says in verse 16. Uh, your translation may say, in addition to all of this, or it may say, above all, it says, take up. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Paul is modeling all these pieces of spiritual armor after what the Roman soldier wore into battle. When the Roman soldier would go into battle, they would take their shield, and it was one time rectangular, and one time it was made of leather and not of uh, metal. And they would go with that shield of leather, and they would dip it into water. 
uh, they would soak that shield in water before they went into battle. Why? Well, a common tactic of the enemies of Rome was to shoot flaming arrows uh, at the Roman soldier. And so you would put those water-soaked shields up, and because they were water-soaked, excuse me, uh, they would help extinguish uh, those fiery darts. When Paul says, take up the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked evil one. Faith in what? Your faith in God. You see, here's the deal. The more convinced that you and I are that God is good, that God is faithful, that God is stronger than what opposes us, then the more consistently uh, we are willing to be on the front line of battle against evil, right? The more we understand who God is, the better it is for us to be on the front line. But we get confused about this shield of faith sometimes. Uh, the shield of faith is not faith in our own spirituality or how much faith we might muster up to use at any given time. It's not in our own faithfulness. That's not the shield of faith. What Paul is talking about doesn't come from our own self-confidence in how great a warrior that we are. It comes from our confidence in God and who God is. It comes from our confidence in Him. When we trust in God's trustworthiness, that is what defeats and destroys the lies and extinguishes the fiery darts of the enemy. It's in our faith in what God can do. So strategy one is just to put on the new person, suit up for battle, show up. Strategy number two uh, we trust in God's character, His faithfulness of who God is. Uh, that's what we are to do, get well. But the third strategy, we want to be able to quote Scripture. Why? Well, let's look and see. Because in verse 17, it says, Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is not by accident that Paul couples these two things together where you take the Word of God and you enter that battle and you fight using God's Word, His sword, against the lies and the doubts and the fears of the enemy. Of all the seven pieces of armor that Paul mentions in this section of Scripture, this piece of armor is the only offensive weapon that Paul describes. The other six deal with a defensive posture of holding ground. Paul takes the Word of God and describes it as a weapon of attack, a weapon of aggression. This third strategy, the Word, God's Word, is meant to make you dangerous. Paul wants us to know that your knowledge of God's Word is what makes you a threat to the power of darkness. So the obvious conclusion, it means for you and for me, that we have to read our Bible and gain knowledge from it. We have to memorize Scripture so it's readily available for, for our use uh, at a moment's notice. This is not something about measuring our own spirituality by how many Scripture verses we can quote. Not at all. But in our everyday devotional life with the Lord, as we're reading His Word, that we leave that Word and we say, help me remember something from what I read today in the place that you put me in conflict so I can call on that word for you as I represent you. When we do that and we follow along um, asking for the Spirit's revelation of the word that we just read for the day, then we memorize tons of Scripture. We may not say it right. We may not say it correctly. But it is used as an aggressive tool in the battle against the evil one. God's Word undoes the lies and the bondage of the enemy. And when you have that understand, understanding and you start quoting Scripture with the knowledge in that way, you become a danger, a danger to the lies and the darkness of the enemy. So strategy number three is that you put the Word of God to work 
in your life. I want to give you a little exercise because I'm going to give you a sentence. As you look at this sentence, you can interchange two letters. Uh, the two letters are D and K. And here's that sentence. Write it down. The word won't work unless you work the word. The word won't work unless you work the word. What do you do with the word of God that is the worth of God's word? I heard it said like this, that the word of God is like a can of paint. The value of the paint is when it is, when it is applied, not while it still sits in the can. Our fourth strategy is prayer. You and I have to understand the power of prayer. Of all the things that Paul tells us to do in this pa passage, prayer is probably the most important strategy uh, that you and I are called uh, to learn. Here's something that I, I've observed in my walk with Jesus. From being involved with uh, clergy and Bible teachers, been involved in seminary, uh, anything that I've been part of in a venue like that, here's what I've, I have observed. I'd be in such a gathering of biblical intellectuals, surrounded by what we could call well-versed and intellectual people. And in those gatherings, I have come to observe and know that Satan doesn't mind us getting in God's Word if Satan can use God's Word to make us argumentative. He really doesn't mind at all. The Bible says that Satan can even quote Scripture. But prayer, folks, when God's people pray, Satan has no time for that. Prayer is always dangerous. When the people of God rise up in faith and they start pleading with heaven to undo strongholds, turn back darkness, turn back evil, that is really dangerous. So you have to have all these strategies. One is not more important than the other. Uh, you have to embrace, you have to put on the new life that Jesus gave you. Make that decision. You must trust God and believe above all else that he is good and trustworthy and never fails. You have to also know the word. Be able to quote scripture, talk to the devil, preach a sermon to the devil in the right moment. But you have to pray. You have to pray. You have to have a life of intersection. Intercession. Look at what it says in verse 18. It's on the screen. Praying always and with all prayers and supplication in the Spirit, be watchful. That is a good description of what a prayer life should look like. When Paul uses the word Spirit, in other words, prayer is done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Folks, as long as you and I are living this life, rest assured that we will see the enemy's presence and we will witness and experience the wake of Satan's destruction in our life. There will be areas where it seems that the devil knows how to get us, how to, how to tempt us, how to put us in fear, how to incite doubt. He knows how to get us to feel insecure. He knows how to make us discouraged. Listen, in those moments, you rise up and you say, you know what, Satan? I'm using you as practice. That's all I'm using you for is practice. Because one day I'm going to outgrow you. And I, I will outgrow your lies. I may not quite know what to do right now, uh, but I will outgrow you. And I'm going to drive you out of my thoughts, out of the stinking thinking that drags me down. I may be right now uh, in a boxing ring with a, a world champion by the name of Satan. But one of these days, uh, I am going to outgrow you because I have a coach that's standing at ringside. And his name is Jesus. And he has said to me that he never fails that he never leaves, and he has given me this victory. 
And it's possible for you as you listen today that you may feel like you've been pummeled. Uh, you felt pressure from the enemy. It's just been one fiery dart after the next. Look, it's, start, it's time for you to start telling Satan who your God is and extinguishing one fiery arrow after the next. It's time to tell Satan who God is and who you are in him. Don't let that beat up mouse lie to you any longer or convince you that he is more than what he is. When you and I have the right perspective on God, then we're going to have a right perspective on the devil uh, and who each one is. You're not a threat to me, Satan. You're a practice. And you will have no more power over me than what I give to you. So I ask you today, as I've asked myself, where are you? Uh, are you overwhelmed? Does it just seem like evil is just hammering against you? If your heart is to serve God and Him alone, then fight. Believe God. Refuse to make peace with your enemy. And do not fall back in the mindsets saying something like, Oh, who am I to do battle against this evil, to do battle against the devil? I'm just measly, old, regular, ho-hum, common Christian Bill Beavers. That's me. Really? Huh. I read something different. I read that when you gave your heart to Jesus, Jesus gave his heart to you. I read that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I read that you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I read that you are a son of and daughter of the Lord God, and that you are an heir of Christ as a co-heir with Jesus. Why, well, I even read that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I read that you are salt and light of, of a society. I read that you belong to the Lord God. I read that you have been purchased with the most precious commodity that this earth has ever known, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. I read that you belong to God. And what the, the Heavenly Father has, that He has called you His son and His daughter. And I read that there's nothing that can snatch you out of your Father's hands. That's what I read. And if all that I read is true, and if Jesus did all of that for you and for me, then maybe the best way for us to say thank you to Him it's just like the opening video, and that's to live this life worthy of his death and what he gave us, and don't waste our life because we are called to duty. And the people of Getwell said, Amen.